Good evening, everyone, and um, hopefully you can see us and uh, we can see you. And if you can't, feel free to move. This is going to be very relaxed. Um, I want to apologise from the outset for my voice, and um, I'm not going to be speaking very much anyway, but <clears throat> it's a little croaky. So, uh, <laughs> good evening, and I want to begin, of course, by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land upon which we gather and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I also want to acknowledge uh, the close friendship between Judith Wright, the poet, uh, whose work we're going to hear tonight, and her wonderful relationship with Ujiru Nunakal. Many of you will know that together they forged an amazing uh, pathway for Mabo and many of the Aboriginal Australian reforms that came into being. So um, that's an important acknowledgement. So on the stage tonight, we have a glamorous composer. We have, and I'm not going to tell you who's who, a glamorous <laughs> composer, a plethora of Pauls, and the apostles, really, uh, John and Andrew. Would you please make them welcome? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do very quick bio notes because I think um, you all know who these people are, but Alana Ketz-Chernan, as you know, is a celebrated and multi-award winning composer. She's received a myriad of awards, um, including Australian composer for her work, Cadences, and a Green Room and a Helpman uh, Award for Wild Swans. Paul Dean, an old friend and well known to Queenslanders, is again residing in Queensland and is currently the um, senior lecturer of clarinet and the woodwind at the Queensland Conservatorium. And his contribution to Queensland and Australian music is legendary. Paul Grabowski, AO, is one of the finest jazz musicians and an incredibly talented pianist. Uh, he's just told me he's a professor now at Monash, at Monash University, um, and if he were to be given a title, it would be Minister for the Arts mm. of the Precinct at Monash. That's right. um, you'll remember Paul from uh, the Queensland Music Festival and also his work at the Adelaide Festival. Uh, John Rogers, who's a friend of all of us from Queensland, and welcome back to Queensland tonight, John. Um, John has um, been a part of musical history in this state um, for as long as I've been around and um, his works are performed all over the world. Uh, welcome, John. Andrew Ford, um, I feel very um, privileged to be um, introducing Andrew, who needs no introduction, um, as a, probably one of our foremost broadcasters um, and um, the... Saturday morning and now Sunday morning shows um, are the highlight of most people in this audience's week. So thank you, Andrew. And Paul Cassidy, um, who's from the Brodskys and is here, I believe, straight from Europe. Is that correct? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Um, and has been uh, working with or is going to work with uh, some of the Griffith students, I believe. Yeah, we did. You did. We did already. Great. Yeah. And um, you've got a 40-year history. I think you joined uh, the group in about 1980, is that right? Or 90, was it? Um, I, I joined in 82. 82. But they're beginning, they're beginning to accept me. Yeah, right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so I thought we'd start the conversation. We're going to talk about the works, but I wanted to start the conversation big. Um, and in preparing for the conversation, I read a really wonderful... Um, treatise, really, on Judith Wright's poetry by um, Veronica Brady, the uh, academic from Western Australia, the, the theologian um, and expert, really, on Judith Wright. And she started this article by asking, what are poets for? And she did give an answer, but I thought we'd work our way through the interview. And by the interview, we might have come to some conclusion about what composers and musicians are for today in what she called Veronica Brady destitute times. I was going to start with you, John. Composers are for, I think, um, composers are the people who spend time alone and make up music for other people to play. 
Yeah, right. That's a lovely, a lovely, simple, clear definition, isn't it? That's, that's the end of that. That's the, the end. end of that, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Does anyone else want to add to that? Or it, it's, you've sort of shut my conversation right down, John. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. No. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, Veronica Brady said she thought Judith, Wright, Judith Wright's work was to speak the unspeakable, that the poet's task was to say things that might otherwise not have been said. If I understood your question correctly, uh, were, were you... Uh, ask it again. What, what was the... So my question was... What, is, what are poets for? What are mus So the okay. analogy is what are composers for? What are musicians for? It's right. a big, broad, philosophical question, but I thought it'd be well, a, it's nice a very one. It's a very pertinent question for me. You can shut me up just when you want to. But very recently, like last week or something, <clears throat> someone called me and said, you have to see this program. It was on BBC, but I have a feeling that this program is available wor worldwide. And if it is, I would really urge everyone of us to go and watch it because it's a musician called Bob Geldof talking about a poet called uh, William Butler Yeats. And, you know, right now, you may know where I'm from already, but uh, <laughs> I am from that Emerald Isle. And um, at the moment, there's all this stuff about 1916 going on, and uh, it's, it's all very kind of like this. And um, this program is astonishing. And the bravery of uh, Geldof, I, I just, um, I take my hat off to him. I once bumped into him in Amsterdam airport and <coughs> foolishly didn't, I, I really wanted to say, you know, give him a hug and say, cool man. <laughs> but I didn't, because I didn't want to bother him with yet another. But if I ever see him again, I will. Uh, give him a big hug and tell him he's amazing because it was an incredibly brave thing and, and what I felt um, he was saying was that Yates, you know, never mind all this, uh, the GPO and the Easter Rising and all these guys going on, Yates took a, he took a different route and, you know, this, the, short, the, the short story is that it, the pen was mightier than the mm. sword mm. and it was really, it, it was an amazing thing to do and incredibly brave at that moment, you know, when everybody was getting a bit gung-ho and remembering the, the bad old days. Yeah. Whereas, in fact, if we were able with the likes of John Hume and these amazing people who were around, you know, through it all, talking and mm. using language and, <laughs> and facts and knowledge and history, and poetry and prose and music. Uh, so we, we, we could maybe get a lot further. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Paul, did you want to speak to it? Well, there are, there are two ways of looking at it, really. I mean, there's music, which is music f for, its, for itself, which is not related to anything in a sense but itself. So it kind of is, you know, it, it's reflecting its own being and it's, it's constructed out of its own grammar and syntax and it doesn't need necessarily to rely on any external stimuli to achieve its ultimate goal, which I think is some kind of transportative moment for human beings, which really does alter the way they feel. Mm. Music invades us mm. in ways that we find disarming. Mm. Can, I, can I interrupt you, though, and say, um, you know, Umberto Eco actually talked about it's not possible for music not to have the cadences of its time, it, despite what its usage is. And I think you're talking about the, the act of being itself. Of well, being I, I sort of dispute that, because yeah. if that were true, then, you know, we wouldn't relate to a Beethoven string quartet, for example, uh, in the way that we do, because we'd be always locating it in 1827, mm. Mm. you know, or 1825. Mm. And, you know, great music, sure, I mean, it's written in a language which the person who wrote it thought of at the time, mm. but there's something about the music which is outside of time and space. Mm. And the fact that it may have been written 
in Vienna in the early part of the 19th century doesn't by any stretch of the imagination restrict its ability to touch us long after the people who originally played it, the people who wrote it, and the people who first heard it have, are dead and buried. But the other Second. music I wanted to allude to, which is of course very germane to what's happening here, is music which is text-oriented. So all of the songs uh, in the project, which we, we've been fortunate enough to be a part of, are linked to Judith Wright's words. And obviously for, for each of us, it's been a personal journey of discovery, mm. firstly to figure out what we think the poetry is trying to say, mm. Mm. which is by no means always, you know, there's no orthodoxy about that. Mm. And then to find a way of translating that into music so that the music and the words together become something different from just the poem. I'm not saying that it's qualitatively greater than but you're, you end up making something different. And if Judith Wright were hearing it, she might go, well, that's extraordinary, quite different from what I imagined, mm. because it, it wasn't exactly what I was thinking when I wrote that poem. But that's the wonderful thing. Music is, is alchemical. Mm. You know, it is some, there's something which mutates and something which transforms with music. Mm. I had that experience when I listened to The Surfer Mm -hmm. um, Kate's piece, be uh, because I uh, learnt it uh, verbatim at school and <laughs> it didn't seem to be, you know. <laughs> mm. But did you want to say anything about that, Andrew? Or? I was thinking when Paul, the Pauls were talking about uh, Stephen Sondheim, actually. I was thinking about that song in Sunday in the Park with George, uh, Finishing the Hat. Um, where the Georges Seurat, the painter, is going on about how you have to finish the hat. He's, he's painting the, the, the painting the Sunday afternoon on the Grand Jat, and um, and it's a detail and it's a small thing in the painting. This particular person's hat, but you have to get it right. You have to finish it. And the the punchline of the song is, "Look, I've made a hat where there never was a hat." And that's the key, I think, to any kind of creativity, that it doesn't really matter whether you are making a grand statement about, you know, world peace or something, or whether you're writing a little sonatine or, or something quite sort of modest and apparently abstract and not about anything except itself. The point is that you're making a hat where there never was a hat, that you are, you, you are being creative, you're putting something there that didn't exist before. And that, to me, is the most important thing of all art. And it, it's something that I thought about a lot, well, I've thought about it quite a lot in the, in the, over the last years, but I, I remember thinking about it after 9-11. And think, at the time I was writing a song cycle, and um, it was settings of poems by Emily Dickinson and Sappho and, you know, and, it, and I just thought, really, what's the point of, of this? Um, <coughs> of, of, surely I, I should be trying to make some sort of big statement here. And, and, at the and for, for some time afterwards, I didn't really want to do anything much. Mm. Um, and then I thought, no, actually, just getting back to continuing to make this song cycle, which is nothing to do with 9-11, is important in itself. Whether or not it's a good piece or a bad piece, at least it will be a hat where there never was a hat. And that's interesting, um, given after the visitors, because it is essentially quite a domestic piece, but it's actually much larger than that. So yes. things can, trans domesticity can transfer into larger things. Paul, did you want to say anything about it? You don't have to, we can, you know. <laughs> As if I wouldn't have something to say. <laughs> um, uh, I'd like to go back to John's point. Um, that, uh, and I think it's a really important time for us to be rediscovering the work of Judith Wright, but also it's a really important time to be a composer. 
Um, and it's also a slightly difficult time to be a composer because we're surrounded by these organisations that are heavily government funded. I'm going to get on my high horse, it's going to be ugly. Um, I'll cut you who, off. Yeah, who um, <laughs> don't want to have anything to do with music that's written today. And, and um, thank God for organisations like the Bro well, quartets, like the Brodsky Quartet. Um, but you're talking about creativity and you know, putting a hat where there wasn't a hat before or, or, and things like that. It's really important that music remains a living, a living art form. And I think in many, many ways, um, classical music, as we call it, is uh, a lot of people have been trying to kill it with programming that goes on in the world. And it's very important time to be a composer and a poet and to make sure that this time is, is, is remembered the same as Vienna is in the early 19th century. Mm. But it's very difficult because, you know, we get commissioned these days to write 10-minute pieces and not 50-minute pieces, or, um, and there's a lot of tokenism towards, towards uh, modern music. So I think it's, um, this is an amazing project and, and one that's been very humbling to be a part of, not only to confront the words of Judith Wright, is an incredibly humbling thing, but actually to, to be a part of this whole process. Um, but it's an, also really important, these sorts of projects are really important for the, for the future of our art form. Can you tell the audience, you used the word humbling, and I think I know why, and I think we know why, but it'd be nice to hear it in your words. Um, well, humbling to read, I mean, I set Sonnet for Christmas for this cycle, and um, I think every day I read it, or every, every hour I read it, when I started writing the piece, it meant something different. Mm. And I guess when I listen to my piece back, which I can't stand, but anyway, when I listen <laughs> to my piece back, I, I think um, it's kind of schizophrenic the way I've gone, done the piece, because the, the, the poem, every line means something to me every time, <laughs> different every time I read it, and that's the, the, the beauty and the glory of Judith Wright. Mm is that it's a, it's, a, it's a living document as much mm. as, as, as anything. And, and I was talking to Paul before about how... Well, I found this, the, the, the poem very difficult to set because it's, it's, um, it's incredibly passionate and compassionate, but also it can also be read incredibly naive as well at the same time, and it's got this in incredible mixture. So I... I I found it humbling in terms of trying to approach it mm, in that thank way. You. And we'll come back to it. I wanted to, um, to begin to talk about the poems and the uh, compositions. Elena, um, your piece, um, Late Spring, um, it's a, quite a short piece, and I, for me, it was the most reflective of the pieces. Um, can you tell us about your compositional journey, um, and particularly, um, the repetition of those two words, then she, then she, then she. Okay, um, well, for me, um, first of all, when I read, and I read a few poems uh, that Katie suggested, um, late spring jumped at me because for some reason it has some kind of mystical power, and that's your word, alchemy. Um, there was something about the words that she used, the moon, the tree, the tree that is fallen, um, the tree that blossoms. There were these incredible poetic images that were powerful, and they were powerful about being a woman. Mm -hmm. And even a woman who, which may be not well, um, but, may, but may be strong. Mm -hmm. And it's also, for me, that poem is about compassion, mm -hmm. and compassion uh, for other women. And there is this sort of kindred spirit and I, among women, and I felt it just spoke to me. And I thought those incredible words, and I agree with Paul, every time I read it, it was something different I saw in it. And I thought in this uh, text, there is the moon, for me, that's like the she, then there is actual woman, or women, in plural, and then there is the tree that is also bearing fruit, and it's blossoming as a woman flower, a piece of music. For me, there's a lots of symbolic meanings in this poem. And I wanted to reflect on its kind of darkness. Yes. Um, it's haunting. Uh, and there was magic about those words. And I thought the words will help me set it, because 
uh, it was not easy setting. It, was, uh, it takes time to find your way into a poem. And it's also, humbling is a word, you have this incredible respect for these beautiful words, and you want to give them as beautiful a setting as possible. And, you, you know, you never think, I never think I've achieved it in any way, um, because, um, you know, the, w the words are so great. Um, how can you, you know, as, as you said, it can't be another, it, it can be only another form. It cannot be, it cannot be better than a poem. Mm -hmm. No way. Um, so you, you work with it the best you can and give it a kind of a, envelop it in this sort of surrounding that carries it mm. in this particular setting here in a concert or in a CD. Um, and a poem will live on as its beautiful gem um, and with this powerful imagery and music, the song will live its own life, you know. Um, so yeah, it was um, very nice for me to, to, to <coughs> be able to be part of this incredible project. And was also mysterious to find out what every, everybody else has written. Chosen. It's yeah. incredible, yeah. 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 Elena, when I um, listened to it the third time, and I, I feel like, um, I, I, can't, I think it was um, Matthew Denevo who talks about listening in to the music, settling into it. And when I settled into it, I thought you captured the, uh, the mellowness and mm. the sort of sadness, really. Mm. For, so for me, it, it, I don't know whether Judith, Judith Wright meant this, or, but the, um, it, it was about ageing for me. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, there's this kindness in the words. And for me, the refrain is more, rather than she, is more believe in the moon. Right. Believe in the moon, because the moon has this mystical power that helps you and gives you strength and feels for you. So it's kind of being friends with it. But that's how I read it. Do you want to read that oh, first God. couple of lines? Or oh. read it. It's there, it's beautiful, it's short. Well, I need my glasses. Oh. That's all right. Bear with me for a moment. I feel like a teacher. Um, the moon drained white by day lifts from the hill where the old pear tree, that's important, fallen in storm springs up in blossom still. <coughs> Women believe in the moon. This branch I hold is not more white and still than she whose flower is ages old. And so I carry home flowers from the pear that makes such obstinate tokens still for fruit it cannot bear. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Paul, I'm just going to go in, in order of the pieces. Right. <clears throat> uh, Paul, Sonnet for Christmas is just really the antithesis of what you think a Sonnet for Christmas is going to be about, yeah, isn't it? It's harrowing. It is harrowing, and yet I, I found it a deeply optimistic Isn't poem. Christmas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and you come to come to <laughs> come to my family for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. And 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 you know this schizophrenic composition you talked about, yeah, you know, it's quite a short poem and yet it's nine minutes the piece. Yeah, he's always going on about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder if you would talk about those variations in movement and particularly um, when um, after and small as a seed in the wild dark we lay and it's like the heavens have opened up. Yeah. Um, I was sort of trying to divide the poem, I guess, into eight and six, which is yep. traditionally... The sonnet, yeah. Um, and in, in a way I was sort of playing with quartet textures as well in, in trying to... Trying to having sort of grown in the last 15 years and being very aware of Katie's voice and being a huge fan of George, of course, when they were um, out, I sort of felt like I, I knew Katie's voice better than I, turns out, I did. Um, <laughs> I thought I knew it better than it turned out. Whatever I'm trying to say, you know what I mean. Um, so I, I tried to capture this, this the change in, in, in mood which happens at... at the ninth line of this poem when, you know, um, and when, when the poem says nothing is, is well, you can you probably re read it. I don't need my glasses to read. Um, I can't read with them. Nothing shall die unless for me it die. Really, that was, that was the line for me that actually in, instructed me 
A, I wanted to set this poem, but also that was the one that I went, okay, that's, that's, the, that's the money, money mm. line, if you know what I mean. That mm. was the one that I wanted mm. to... And then the struggle for me, and it <coughs> took me about three months to write another note of music once I'd written that line, because I didn't know where the hell to go after that. So that's why the music, sorry, Paul, goes all mental at that point. Um, but, yeah, it was, it, it was the most difficult thing I've ever done, right, this piece. Really? Compositionally, mm. without a doubt, because I, I didn't feel in any way that my language spoke Judith Wright's language, and yet I had to have the courage to go through with it, in a sense. It was... Yeah. Yeah, it was... It was I, I, I use that word humbling once yeah. again. I, I mean, I found the conclusion of her poem is just so grown up. Murder and hate and love are like a mine. You know, she owns her stuff, doesn't yeah, she, yeah. as a poet. And I felt in your piece, after the freneticism and the kind of, um, that you settled, and the music owned itself as well. Yeah. That was a feeling I had. Yeah, mm. well, I'm glad you think that. Yeah. Andrew. I don't feel very settled when I listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure Paul doesn't feel very settled when he's playing it. <laughs> Andrew, um, after the visitors is perhaps the most narrative, isn't it, of all of the pieces that have been chosen. Um, I love it when, you know, the, the dramatist in me loves it when I can find a denouement, and I absolutely found a denouement in, in your work. Um, can you talk to me about the interior and exterior and how that worked musically? It, it's... The poem is about how you feel when the visitors leave. Um, <laughs> and it's in... There, there are two moods in the piece. Uh, um, the first mood is the frenetic mood, which comes from trying to describe what it's like to have a house <laughs> full of visitors and how you have to um, wait on them not just in terms of giving them food and drink, but also catering to their um, n other needs, their emotional needs. <coughs> um, and then the, the peace that descends once the door is closed and you've got the house back to yourself. Um, and so it's, it's really, although it's the shortest song of, of all of the ones you'll hear tonight, um, it's, it's, it's the most dramatic, I suppose. It's like a little shainer, a little operatic shainer. Um, and, and it comes all out of the poem. I mean, the music comes from the poem. I, I, I've, I've set a lot of poetry to music um, over the years. And for better or for worse, I, I've found a way of doing it which... I probably should try to break out of one day, but now I seem to do it the same way each time, which is to speak the words to myself, speak them aloud, start to sing them aloud, and before I compose anything else, compose the vocal line. Um, sometimes I'll just compose maybe three or four lines of the poem and then go back and add instruments, but sometimes I will compose the whole vocal line. And in fact, that's certainly what I did with this piece. And I'm currently writing a song cycle for um, Paul Grabowski, actually, for the Monash Art Ensemble. I hope it's in my range. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, if, if I got, die tonight, I, I don't mean metaphorically, I mean literally, if I die tonight, um, what Paul will get sent by my widow uh, will be a complete <laughs> vocal line of all six songs and bass notes and uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I won't be around to hear what you do with that because <laughs> I suspect you might do something more interesting than I will. <laughs> But that's what currently exists. The whole, all of the vocal lines are written, and, and I know exactly what the bottom notes are all the way through, but there's not much else there. Um, and that was how this, this came about. And so the words, the rhythm of the words, and in particular the structure of the words, 
to tell me everything about the music. And, and if it's going well, it, it, it's, it's, I, I'm barely thinking. It, it's it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, as unselfconscious a form of composing as I know, setting words to music. I wanted to have time to get on to that. I heard you um, talking with Ben Quilty, talking about um, at, at the end of something, not even being aware of how you got there. <clears throat> and I think you've just alluded to that. Um, I'd love for you to read us the last two stanzas. I put away the glasses. Thank you. Where are we? Oh, here we are. Right down the bottom. Yes. Yes, so this is all the, all of the frenetic stuff has gone. I put away glasses, adjust the house to my shape, and turn to my work. Is it you again, alone? We are old companions, self. We go on, sometimes in love, sometimes lonely with the old pang, the old delight, the living balance between waking, waking, and sleep. Beautiful, thank you. Paul, um, Paul Grabowski, um, now yours clocked in at uh, 4 minutes 24, so mm -hmm. <laughs> not the longest but not the shortest. Mm -hmm. uh, Veronica Brady said, like all major love poets, Wright understands and celebrates the conjunction between life and death. I want to know what was in your mind as you composed it. And for me, there was mystery in this work. It started with a... I thought it sounded a European kind of beginning, but I think it wasn't I'll so much more, European like as otherworldly. And that reminded me of when you fall in love mm. and how it is otherworldly. <laughs> and then things go awry. Can you talk about that journey for you? <laughs> how long have you got? <laughs> um, well, look, uh, you know, love is a febrile thing. And... Uh, what attracted me to this poem, of course, was it is about those two hoary old chestnuts, love and death. It's in the company of lovers. The company of lovers. And, and, you know, rather than the, the very reflective um, state of some of the other poems, it's, it's quite a, a cry, a cri du coeur, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, because really it's about in a world in which death assails us, there is always love. And it's an almost Schopenhauerian mm. idea. Mm. It's, you know, it's Wagnerian in a, in a kind of... It's just, this is well-travelled territory, of course, in music. So I wanted to do something which conveyed the, f the febrile and, and unstable nature of love, you know, the, the kind of um, the shimmering effervescence and, and feeling that, you know, it is a fragile thing. Um, there is a section, you know, about two-thirds of the way through, which is a kind of a climactic point um, in which the yearning, the sense of, you know, of wanting to embrace the moment becomes the kind of overriding theme mm. before we return to the fact that at some point it's all going to be over. So I guess, you know, in a way I tried to... You know, I, I hear the music as, as being tendrils, like fingers exploring something. And it's, it's... I think I even... You know, the, the direction, the overall direction is, is to instabile, you know, and another one which I've never used before, susurrando, which is whispering. So it's, this, this thing about voices talking. That, the, that love is like somebody whispering in your ear mm. constantly. That it's, you know, you are in the zone and it will not leave you alone day or night. You know, when, when it's happening, you cannot escape. And unlike uh, the way Andy worked, I, I wrote it as a song. So I wrote, I wrote the melody and the chords as I would, as if I was writing a jazz song, you know, except that the chords are very, that they are not logical. Mm. Uh, for the first section, they, they, they take weird corners. Um, and then in the, the section that I was alluding to before, there's a sudden uh, feeling of, of ascent and where Katie gets to really let go. We shall be lonely. Yeah. After we shall be lonely. Yeah. Beautiful. Or well, the embrace, you know, the, the word embrace, which, yeah. you know, I, I said as a big melisma. Mm. 
So, you know, again, it's, it's like a little tone poem, I mm. guess, and mm. um, explores a lot of sonorities. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, I've, I've worked with Katie before. I did a, this is my second song cycle project. We did a, a, a series of poems of Dot Porter uh, called Before Time Could Change Us, which is a jazz song cycle. Um, which we did back in 2004, I think, or five, something like that. Uh, yeah, it was actually it was a commission for the Queensland Music Festival mm. originally. And uh, so it was really interesting to return to writing for her again after, you know, I mean, her life has moved on. She's now a mother of children and, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, this, and uh, this piece, more than any other, uh, reminded me of the, why it was called With Love and Fury. Yeah. And, and I wanted to ask all of you, but we've got to talk to John and Paul a little more um, about the title. And I also wanted to ask you whether you think ultimately Judith Wright could be called a romantic. And I, I realise that's a very controversial thing to ask, but I, it's interesting whether she's essentially optimistic, I think, or not. I'll just finish by saying one thing. That, that particular poem reminded me, in my imagination, of certain paintings of Arthur Boyd. Mm -hmm. That kind of deeply human, but slightly distorted, and to a degree, quite dark vision. Do you want to read the last stanza? Death marshals up his armies round us now. Their footsteps crowd too near. Lock your warm hand above the chilling heart, and for a time I live without my fear. Grope in the night to find me and embrace, for the dark preludes of the drums begin. And round us, round the company of lovers, death draws his cordons in. And that's the other thing I did during, in the setting of the poem, I've got like a drum tattoo, which is going right through the quartet, oh, pretty much for the whole piece, somewhere, up, down, it's, it's kind of, we'll listen it's around. That. John Rogers, mm -hmm. um, your piece is called um, Failure of Communication, and I want to just spend a moment to say, it's a painful irony, really, that you have suffered meningitis and that you have some uh, failures in communication in some areas of your body. That would be accurate to say. Mm -hmm. So um, congratulations on getting yourself um, back up and here tonight and on writing this piece. It's tremendous and really um, deserves our appreciation. The thing I loved most about your piece um, it's the first stanza, and I'll try and read it. What is, the what is the space between enclosing us in one united person, yet dividing each alone, and the music is silent? I thought that was a very brave thing to do. Yeah. Can you talk to me about your compositional journey? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, there's, there's, there's something quite surprising, isn't there? The flamenco. Yeah, yeah sure. So, um, um, let me speak. Um, yeah, I had a stroke, um, like last, the year before last. Um, and this is the first piece I've been asked to write since then. So that was interesting in itself. <laughs> and it's incredibly beautiful. And, so. um, and it's interesting that it's called failure of communication because <laughs> I can't communicate <laughs> the way I could before. Yeah. It, 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 there is a wonderful irony there, isn't there? Yes, and, uh, and um, briefly, I I thought that because it was a piece about failure that 
uh, that a passion of mine, which is for flamenco, might be applicable to this piece. So I wrote it in a flamenco form. Mm. And um, even if no tooth throat, would definitely wouldn't have thought that. I mean, well, as far as I know, anyway. And um, um, and, and you told me that this afternoon because we met. And I went back, and it hadn't occurred to me, and I went back and listened to it, mm -hmm. and there it was, <laughs> as clear as mud. I thought, how did I not hear this? Mm -hmm. And there's a wonderful story about where flamenco entered your life. Do you mm -hmm. want to tell us that quickly? Yeah, in my life, <laughs> in a strange way, when, when I was um, about, when I lived in Ayr, which is near Townsville, up in North Queensland, and, um, it was about ten or so. I, my parents took 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 us to Temple to see what was it called El Dorado and Parade, and they were a violin. Uh, so they were a piano and guitar duet playing at the Townsville um, Civic Centre. Civic Centre or something, yeah. And um, what they were doing there, I don't know, honestly, to this day. I don't know what they were doing there. But they were Spanish guys and they were playing piano and guitar. My <laughs> level I don't know <laughs> at all. <laughs> and um, and, um, and my parents took, took us because, took the family because they told us that had a saloon piano and they thought we'd like to see the pianist and, and the guitarist was really the most striking thing about this group. And, um, and, uh... He wanted to take it away, didn't he? No, 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 he wasn't that guitarist. He wasn't that guitarist. Oh, he, wasn't that that guitarist. <laughs> he was another guitarist and, and, and anyway, and, and then shortly afterwards, uh, my mum showed me a pep, uh, article from the Townsville Daily Bulletin that said um, that a Spanish guitarist called Maestro Joaquin Gomez had given a recital in Townsville and would be living there then. And he would be teaching lessons at a guitar shop in Townsville. And, and, um, so, so we went up there, my, my dad drove me up, and, and I learnt guitar in Townsville. Flamenco guitar? Yeah, flamenco guitar, which is pretty weird. <laughs> so you can learn flamenco guitar in Townsville. <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> it's really strange from an authentic guy who was trying to escape the whole thing. I found out later that he was trying to escape it. He was failing, but he wasn't failing to communicate, was he? No, he wasn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. All right, well, we'll listen out for the flamenco in the piece and you'll hear it very, very... Um, it'll come through very clearly. Paul, um, as an Irish person and um, not an Australian, how has it been working on uh, Judith Wright's poetry with these Australian composers? Can you talk about how the quartet has enjoyed it or found it challenging? Well, or whatever. I mean, I, I am Irish, but uh, <laughs> I wonder how many people here are Irish. You know, I'm Irish, but I'm Australian. I, I mean, yeah. I love Australia. We've been coming, Australia's been so good to our quartet, and we've been coming here for, you know, 25 years already, and I feel in, extremely close. When I come here, I feel absolutely at home. You know, people are so wonderful. And, and I've been saying to as many people as I can that you, know, you have got the most extraordinary set of composers in your midst in this country. And not just an incredible set of composers, but um, seems to me uh, Australia has got every bit as much as you hear one bar of Copeland, you know where you are. You hear one bar of Britain, 
not only do you know you're in England, but you know you're actually in Aldborough. Mm. <laughs> and and he, you, know, you hear um, th these people have given Australia a voice, you know what I mean? And it's a very strong voice. But um, I just wanted to say, if I may, because, like, you know, our job is to interpret this stuff that, that they write down. And um, it, it's not always that easy, you know, like I say to, uh, often I say to, if I'm teaching sometimes, uh, you know, if you're lucky, some composers these days, they say, imagine an October morning in Victoria, a little squirrel wonders what it would have been like to grow up, you know. <laughs> Whereas, you know, people like Beethoven and Schumann and these people, they just went, P or F. You know? <laughs> well, thanks, you know, you can teach a monkey that in about five minutes. So, but, so we have to get past that. We have to try and understand what this is. And often, you'll probably know yourself, you go around humming songs like, one of our favorite lines is, is, is um, uh, the, uh, which Jackie used to always sing, our cellist. She, she's terrible with lyrics. And um, she used to sing, the pay paradise put up a parking lot. <laughs> so she thought, she thought it was a supermarket <laughs> called the pay paradise, for example. Um, or, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I actually wrote to Paul McCartney saying, but hey, man, I love you, but you've missed an obvious one, you know. Still it leads me back to the long winding track. I mean, how could you miss that? So, did you get a reply? Well, I, told, I did tell him that because I couldn't resist it. And he kind of, anyway, we had a laugh about that. But um, the, the thing is that when we're playing music, um, you know, often, you're left with your, with your own kind of imagination and music can go in different places. Sometimes when we're working on, on uh, songs that uh, we're playing in a certain way and um, maybe the vocalist will say, can I just tell you what I'm singing at this bit? And suddenly the whole thing becomes clear how you should be playing. You shouldn't be playing in a romantic fashion with big wide vibrato, but you should be playing absolutely uh, glassy or whatever. So it, it leads me to believe, you know, it leads me to wonder how much music that comes before um, is being misinterpreted. But finally, I'm nearly finished. I, I want to tell you a, a quick story, which I think is uh, very relevant, although it's, um, I'm taking you to a different place. But a couple of years ago, we played all the Shostakovich quartets in Bologna in Italy. And these amazing people there, the promoters, who were really inspired and uh, fantastic, and they wrote to Shostakovich's widow, Irina, who is still alive, very much alive. And she came. She invite, they invited her to our Shostakovich. We were doing it over a weekend. We don't like to mess about. And um, so we were doing the 15 quartets in one weekend, and she came, and she sat where you are. And we had to play the ninth quartet, which was written for her, which was quite an experience, I have to tell you. But anyway, afterwards we went for dinner and I found myself sitting next to her and, uh, you know, we were talking about the weather and the wine and the food. And, the, and after a while I just thought, you know, this is crazy. I mean, I must be mad. This is a one-off. This is not going to happen again. And I plucked up the courage and I turned to her and I said, look, I'm so sorry, I, you know. I know you must get this all the time, but could I just ask you one question about your, your uh, you know, departed husband? And she said, oh, no, sure, no, no, sure. So I said, I think she was going, she, want, she thought I was going to say, you know, I don't know, uh, which center forward impressed him the most because he was a great soccer fan. Um, but I didn't. I said, uh, I just want to ask you, what is this? What does that mean? And she kind of went, uh, she said, well, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? And I said, well, you know, what is that? What is it that pervaded almost every single bar of music this guy wrote? 
across the board. You can, you can almost get everything he wrote into these three events. Boom, boom, boom. Mm. So she turns to me and she says, but Jim Moy. So it's uh, in, uh, you can say, that. so <laughs> for, forgive my, but, but she said, Boji moi. Boji moi. So, Almighty God, or oh my God. Mm. Something like that, yeah? So I went, oh, the secret. <laughs> <laughs> See, no sooner had I written it down in my little notebook than she said, she said another, you'll know what this is, but another like this. And I looked at her and she said, never again. Nadji, nad, nad, mm. Never anyway, again. Yeah, never again. Nikakda, nikakda boshi. Yeah. Nikakda boshi. Yeah, nikakda. 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 Never. Mm. Never again. So I was surprised. Oh my God. Wow. And I said, so. So it's not the uh, knocking on the door, you know, with the suitcase and everything. And she said, yes, of course. I mean, everyone had the suitcase packed, ready for the off. Absolutely. I said, right. And then she said, and don't forget. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> Did she really? Yeah. And I just, I thought. And finally, she turned to me and she said, you know, it's, it's actually too personal. But the, the point of the story um, is imagine if she had said, Almighty God, can I have another glass of wine, please? You know, that's it. That's it over. And I'm sure you ask any of these amazing composers here, the last thing they want is to nail down the music. Is that, am I right? I mean, the, the beauty is you, you, you can't say that music is this, because like these poems, you know, they're all saying every time they read a poem, it changed. I would hope, otherwise we're defunct, um, that every time you hear a piece, um, other things become possible. Like you think, I would imagine you write something and somebody plays it in a certain way, and you think, wow, I never even realized that it could have that. Anyway. Secret code. Sure. Secret code. Yeah. Um, look, I, I'm getting the wind-up signal. I could talk all evening. I could just sit here and listen amazing, to you yeah. all. So, yeah. um, just before we finish, Andrew, yeah. is there anything you would like us to particularly listen out for in your piece? I don't know whether I should tell you this. Singers should never tell composers what their bottom and top notes are because they will go and write them. <laughs> <laughs> and Katie Noonan told me her bottom note was D. Can you believe that? I said, I want to write for your bottom register because I think it's, it's underused and it's rather beautiful. She said, you know I go down to D. So the last note of my piece is a D, and you won't hear it tonight, but you will hear it on the CD. <laughs> and the reason you won't hear it tonight is that, of course, it's only there under certain circumstances, and it's not there if you've been singing very high for quite a long time, mm -hmm. which you will be doing in the songs preceding mine, and indeed in the first part of mine. I should know better. Mm. Um, so you're, but she, she sent me a, an email from London during the recordings to say... Um, uh, we've got it down, except for the last note. But I'm going to go home tonight, and I'm going to stay up late, talk a lot, drink some whiskey, and I'm going back in the morning, and I'm going to sing that, D. <laughs> and you can hear it. Yeah. Not tonight, but on the CD, which you will have to buy. Thank you very much. Would you thank Andrew, please? <laughs> uh, and Paul, is there anything, any secret codes you'd like to induct us into? No. You're happy? <laughs> You're happy? You've had said all you need to Maybe say. the grovelling quintuplets and the viola. Okay. Have a listen to those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Would you thank Paul, please? <laughs> thank you. John. No. No, I think you just listen for the flamenco and uh, particularly in the second half of the poem where it gets closer and closer. But very, very beautiful. Such a, such a strong piece. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is an amazing piece. Would you congratulate wow. and thank you. Elena. 
well, it's um, not a complex piece, but there is quite a complex, um, the texture of the strings works quite independently to the voice, as you've noticed. Um, at some point, the strings take over the melody, but mostly it's like two worlds working together. And that's about it, I can say. Would you thank you? <laughs> thank you. Paul. Oh, I've played my cards, you so have. <laughs> if you've got to listen out for the hidden ostinatos, yes. ostinati, yeah. I suppose is the right way to say it. The whispering. And the whispering, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you know, you said it's a kind of, it's a very steamy piece, right? It's a steamy piece. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so would you call, would you, you, you wouldn't describe it. It's a sexy it. piece. It's a sexy it piece, is. yes. It is, Absolutely. unashamedly. Yes. <laughs> we're, all, we're all fighting for the second violin line. Yeah. You know? yeah. There's this amazing, really, an amazing second violin line. Whoa. Yes. <laughs> and, and Paul, would you agree that it, it feels like love and fury? Well, you know, that's up to the listener. Yes, beautiful, that is beautifully said. And uh, Paul, we'll let you go because you've got to be on stage. But would you... Oh, thank Paul Grabowski, please. <laughs> and thank you to Paul Cassidy, and you'll hear more of him shortly. And thank you for being here and for supporting Australian new music. Yep. Good night. Enjoy the concert. <laughs>